So we're going to have kind of three parts to this. We're going to go over the biology and see kind of where the mushrooms fit in. And then we're going to get into the life cycle of the mushroom. And that will lead us into the actual breeding techniques. So we're going to go ahead and just jump right in with the very top of biological taxonomy. So number one, you have domain. And there's three different domains. There's bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And we're going to focus on eukarya. Um, it's the only domain that consists of multicellular uh, invisible organisms uh, like animals, plants, and trees. So if it's multicellular, it's eukarya. It excludes bacteria and archaea. And those are almost the same thing. Uh, I think that the UK, um, as well as Greece and Brazil, would probably classify those as the same thing. I know that once we take the next step into kingdom, we'll see that difference. Uh, but bacteria are single cell organisms. And the difference between archaea and bacteria um, is basically their, their, I guess, chemical makeup, uh, how what their cells are made out of, as well as their taxonomic placement. Um, <clears throat> taxonomists and biologists have looked at these, and they all agree that they are not of the same ancestral lineage as bacteria and at some point they split. Um, here we can see an example uh, kind of seeing that archaea probably led into eukarya and bacteria split off at the beginning. That's going to be their differentiation there. Um, and this is important just for various breeding techniques that are being passed around within the community. Um, if we look at the six kingdoms, we have animals, plants, fungi, protist, bacteria, and archaebacteria. Um, real quick, we see that the UK, I guess Great Britain, India, Greece, Brazil, uh, actually classify into five systems. So they don't, they kind of have Monera, which makes up bacteria and archaebacteria. Um, Monera, um, the definition for that is the kingdom of prokaryotic organisms that include bacteria and reproduce asexual being budding or fission. So in protist, the single-celled organism of the kingdom protista, such as protozoma or algae. So <clears throat> One thing to consider, I guess, as we're going through this, um, just kind of looking at how they differentiate these, like the, the U.S. kind of breaks it down in uh, fungi is a eukaryotic multicellular, protista is eukaryotic unicellular, <clears throat> And going back to eukarya, um, it can get uh, <clears throat> a little bit confusing because protista are in eukarya, even though they are um, unicellular. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have the bacteria, which are prokaryotic unicellular, and those are also the same as the archaea, which are just different because of their biological features and taxonomic placement, mostly their uh, chemical makeup, molecular makeup, is where, is they, where they fall within the uh, biological placements. Uh, whereas Great Britain kind of breaks this down 
you see that they represent fungi with eukaryotic multicellular uh, protists as eukaryotic unicellular and Monera, which is prokaryotic unicellular. Um, prokaryote, a single celled organism that has neither a nucleus with a membrane nor specialized organelles. A eukaryote. Those which have a nucleus. Um, so you could have a nucleus and be multicellular. You can have a nucleus and be unicellular. You could not have a nucleus and be unicellular. Uh, and that's those are kind of the distinctions here within uh, the the kingdoms besides plants, obviously, and animals. Uh, and the difference between archaea and bacteria, again, is just going to be their chemical makeup as well as their taxonomic placement. So going to the next uh, step here after kingdom would be phylum. And uh, I suggest everybody kind of, you know, go back, do some research, really just wanting to do a quick little run over off this. Um, our two main phylum, phyla of fungi that we're going to be looking at usually is going to be Ascomitota or Sidiomycota. I thought I had that pulled up. There are... Like six or so other phyla of fungi, but all cultivated mushrooms are in Ascomycota or Basidiomycota. Um, the Basidiomycetes uh, contains uh, Pleurotus, lion's mane, uh, whereas Ascomycetes contains cordyceps, truffles, morels. And we'll get into that more when we uh, look at the life cycle of the mushroom. Just going kind of race through here. There are also three subphyla of the uh, Basidiomycetes. And that's Agaricomycotina. Uh, let's see if I have this pulled up here. Yes, right here we have the Agaricomycotina, also known as the Hymenomycetes. Um, as compared to uh, the Eustilogenomyces, which is the rust, or sorry, excuse me, the smut fungus. And then there's also the uh, Puccineomycotina. Uh, so there's, those are the subphyla of Basidiomycetes. There's the rust fungus, there's the smut fungus, and then there's the uh, what was otherwise known as the hymenomycetes. Um, they're known for the structure, uh, the spore bearing structure known as the hymenium, which is usually underneath what's known as a cap. Uh, and basidiospores that are forcibly discharged uh, from that area. It does also include lion's mane, as mentioned. Uh, Traditionally, they were uh, just differentiated um, as Homo basidiomycetes, uh, those being the true mushrooms, or hetero basidiomycetes, which was the jelly rusts and smuts. Uh, there's classes of the uh, below the phyla. Uh, Agar Agaricomycetes would be the first class of uh, the phyla Basidiomycetes. This is going to be different than uh, as compared to the Dacrymycetes, which is the coral fungi. Uh, 
and the Chimelo Mycetes, uh, which is like a gelatinous basidio carp. And those are, you can kind of see, are different than um, some of the other ones that are going to be a lot similar as we come up. Uh, however, I would say that Lion's Mane is probably the most unique out of all of them within uh, Agarica Mycetes. Within the class of Agarica Mycetes, there are a couple subclasses. Uh, Agarica Mycetidae is where a lot of our common uh, mushrooms are going to be. We have Agaricales, which is going to include the Agaricus, Boletus. Um, these are all orders within the subclasses. There's also um, Phallomytidae. Uh, but we're mostly going to focus on the orders of Agaricales, Boletus, and um, other Basidiomycetes. Now was probably a good time to point out clades as well. Once you get um, into orders, you start to, uh, and I guess after the classes, we're going to start looking at uh, different families within these orders. Uh, and that's when things start coming together more for breeding capabilities, I suppose. This is an example of a uh, clades. So Strophariaceae is a family in the order of Agaricales. Uh, it contains the Strophifera, Strophiaria um, genus. Uh, another family within the order of Agaricales is going to be Pleurotaceae, which contains all of the oyster mushrooms. Um, you can see over here on the right that, you know, it breaks it down kind of like we are in I'm really just trying to get the point across so people have an understanding of what techniques are applicable in, I guess, which regards, because you can't just assume that a breeding technique that works for uh, bacteria will also work for, um, I guess, eukarya or if a breeding technique that might even work for a certain genus or family would work for that same. And I mean, it also has to do with relativity because you're going to have higher success rates the closer you breed in relation to the organisms. Uh, Amanitaceae, a uh, family that contains Amanitas. Schizophilaceae, the Schizophilium commune family. Uh, Boletalis is actually another order inside the uh, Agaricomycetes uh, subclass or Agaricomycetiae subclass. Within the order of Polyporalis, you can see that there is the family of Ganodermatesiae, Fomatopsidaceae. Uh, the Fomatopsidaceae is the common conchs. Oops. And the Ganodermatesiae is Ganodermas. You can see the genera is included right here. And then that is going to bring us into our uh, next taxonomic bracket, genera. Uh, I think I just had some notes. Um, there is another order in Agaromycetes, Gericomycetes, the Rusalis. Uh, you can see it includes the family Hericiae. Uh, and if I were to give some you can see how many strains, or I'm sorry, species are in some genera. 
uh, like the Pleurotus genera, for example, in the family Pleurotaceae, in the order Agaricales of the class Agaricomycetes, in the division uh, Psidiomycota, Mycota, or I guess another uh, a phylum you could also call it. Um, I had list so as an example um in the family agaricaceae there's 85 genera with over 1300 species uh, in the Strophariaceae family, there's 18 genera with over 1,300 species. Uh, the Pleurotus family has four genera with 94 species. Uh, Aminitaceae has eight genera with an unknown amount of species. The Ganodermaceae, Ganodermataceae has eight genera with over 300 species. The Bolitaceae may have one genus with 100 species. So I think also a note on here for Trichoderma has 254 species. Uh, cordyceps, 600 species. Claviceps, that which produces ergot, has about 50 species and is as also Ascomitoca. A specific example of a species would be like Pleurotus osteatus. It's probably the most common uh, mushroom species I could think of, or maybe even a psilocybe cadenzi. Uh, a good example of strains of uh, mushroom, I think, would be the Pleurotus Australis variation uh, columbinus. Definition of a strain uh, is a genetic variant, a subtype or a culture within a biological species. Um, so it's pretty much any, any biological difference, any tiny genetic differences. Like if something isn't a clone, it's not true to strain. And then even then it could be uh, epigenetically altered, but that's something we'll get into a little bit later also. Um, a variation compared to a strain, a variation in biology is any difference between cells, individual organisms, or groups of organisms. So again, a strain uh, and variation are almost uh, synonymous in that regard. And we also get into phenotype, a phenotype, uh, a set of observable characteristics of an individual resulting interaction from the interaction of its genotype with the environment. So phenotype is just, I mean, it is a trait, essentially. It is an observable characteristic uh, in just one. Like, it could be blue eyes. It could be uh height, it could be um, uh, hair color. Uh, genotype is another important consideration. So uh, a genotype is the, the genetic information that is making up uh, the phenotype. So a genotype versus a phenotype a phenotype is a detectable expression of a genotype. Uh, genotype refers to the genetic code of an individual. This is the information that is found inside the cells. Everything that someone inherited from their parents. Uh, there's a person who has brown hair, but his cell contains one brown hair, one blonde hair allele the genotype includes all this information even though the person doesn't have blonde hair so like you can have a gene and 
you could have a blue eye gene, but you could still have brown eyes. Uh, and the brown eyes is the expression. The brown eyes would be the, the phenotype. Whether you have blue or brown eyes, that is a phenotype. And the genotype is actually like the, the invisible structure within your DNA. Uh, we can also get into epigenetics. Further from that, just a, it's, it's a study of how behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. So even if, say, you have a clone that has undergone, say, uh, environmental stresses or even just changes, it can be altered. Uh, if you kind of just look at this diagram, they're, they're alterations. They're actually like methyl, methylations that attach to the DNA and uh, cause different expressions within it. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain. I would recommend that uh, if somebody is interested in understanding uh, epigenetics a little bit further, I would look up this specific video and watch it. They do a really good job at explaining epigenetics. Uh, I don't think that's super necessary unless you run, say, a lot of clones or you have a clone culture or you work with commercial cultures over and over again. You maybe want an understanding of epigenetics. It's not going to be a huge factor in breeding. Uh, things that can cause uh, epigenetic uh, factors, diet, aging, drugs, environmentals, chemicals, uh, just considerations. Another thing to consider is RNA. There is a difference between RNA and DNA. So when you're looking into breeding techniques, just keep that in mind. Uh, Layla is one or two or one of two or more alternative forms of a gene that arise by mutation and are found at the same place on a chromosome. An allele is a variation of the same sequence of nucleotides at the same place on a long DNA molecule. So allele versus genotype. Each pair of alleles represents the genotype of a specific gene. So I guess you could assume that you're going to get uh, different traits from the parents. So they're going to contribute to that genotype and they're going to contribute alleles to those factors. You could almost think of gene as like a, a section of the DNA that is made up with different alleles that give you uh, those traits. I touch on strains. I was trying to think of some good examples to compare strains. So they tell you here to select a phenotype. So I think we just learned that a phenotype is kind of like a characteristic. Um, it is a specific trait, like um, say purple Girl Scout cookies or a, a particularly gold mushroom or something like that. I'd say that the phenotype with POW, because uh, I think that these are, or if they, I don't think that they sell, uh, and, you know, I mean, like, obvious, I don't think, you know, comparing Piopini and Goldenaki, you know, I think that these are all, you know, uh, different varieties or different genus of different, also different species, though. And I was going to say the PAL strain that I worked with was good. It was dense. It was small. It was fast. On the other hand, I worked with a... Uh, 9514 Lions Main Strain. Uh, this one was a lot bigger, fluffier, uh, maybe took another day longer, maybe yielded a little bit more. And here they have, uh, they say strain, so you know, compared to phenotype or whatever. Um, I also, I think now we run. 
Yeah, I think we are just growing the CNS now. And we found that to be kind of like the perfect balance of uh, yield, size, and density, whereas the PAL was kind of like just more dense and small and didn't really fill the box as well. And the 9514 was just like super puffy and kind of soft, filled the box great, but didn't have that type of texture. I think that this one we settled on because it's right in the middle. And those are, you know, those are a good example of phenotype. Um, so moving into uh, the life cycle, I suppose, and that'll get work us back into uh, the the mushroom. So suppose real quick, I could go over. So we have a a fungal spore. We're looking at ascospores. You know, we know what an asco is because of like ascomycetes. It is their spore producing structure compared to the cidiomycetes. So ascospores kind of make these these sacks, they bags of uh, spores almost. That's how uh, morels and truffles and uh, cordyceps are producing their spores. And there's the basidiomycetes, which are producing their spores on structures called basidias. And generally, four spores are produced. And this isn't to be confused with tetra or bipolarity, because there are bipolar basidias my CDs that also form their structures like this that I understand. Um, a spore, by definition, a minute, typically one-celled reproductive unit capable of giving rise to a new individual. Um, looking at just like a rough little overview of fungal spores, you kind of see that they do come in a wide shape, a variety of shape and sizes. One thing that I think is important is to know that a spore has a, uh, a nucleus. It also has mitochondria. Mitochondria is essentially where all the, uh, the activity happens most often. Uh, or I guess I should say the most activity. Now, a ribosome, a minute particle consisting of RNA. So again, just kind of touching on that RNA to differentiate it from DNA. Mostly RNA just makes proteins. Fungal spores are single cells, each with one nucleus, containing one set of chromosomes. So, and it's important that we know what a chromosome is as well. A chromosome is a thread-like structure of nucleic acids and proteins. And you can kind of disregard the nucleic acids and proteins. We're just trying to stay up with the conceptuals of this as we're running through it. Uh, found in the nucleus of most living things. So there's there are chromosomes in the nucleus, in the spore, and that's where the DNA is. DNA is essentially, I mean, a chromosome is essentially DNA. It's all round, wound up uh, around histones and nucleosomes, and that's what the DNA is. In here... Uh, in the uh, in the DNA, different those each twist you could almost visualize as like a gene, and all those uh, branches between them that connect are the alleles or the genotypes. Specific genotypes making up an entire phenotype that which is a trait, uh, and all that is contained within the DNA that is in the chromosome that is in the nucleus that is in the spore. And then again, epigenetics can affect these, uh, these DNA sections, particularly around the, uh, 
the histones. A nucleosome is a basic structural unit, DNA packaging in eukaryotes. Um, I don't think it's super important just to kind of visualize what like a, a chromosome is. Uh, histone is any group of basic protein found in chromatin. Chromatin is just material in which chromosomes and organisms are composed. It's basically just DNA and RNA protein. Um, so those are just, you know, miscellaneous terms that probably aren't going to be too important. RNA, nucleosome, ribosome, uh, all contained within the chromosome, uh, which is just made out of DNA, essentially. Um, and your DNA is making up your genes, which are these little segments. Kind of like I was describing, like these sections can just make up sections of DNA are made out of genes or make up the entire gene. This gene is full of genotypes. A gene is a sequence of nucleotides forming part of a chromosome, which is a gene is a portion of DNA. Here we are back at alleles, and allele is one or more alternative forms of a gene. Genes are chunks of DNA that contribute to particular traits. Alleles are different versions of a gene. So a gene versus allele, uh, because I do think that that can get kind of tricky on a uh, very tiny scale. So a gene is a segment of DNA which controls a trait. Uh, allele is a variant of a very particular gene. So like I was saying, you can imagine like that double helix and all its connections. Each little connection is essentially two genes, but an allele is just like a different version of the gene. And when they come together, uh, it's just part of the genotype. Like the, those, those are those individual connections would be a genotype, and they come together to make the gene, which gives you the visual expressions of the phenotype, which is just and you can have a lot of different phenotypes inside of one organism. You know, like I could be tall with blue hair and big muscles. So you know, those are like three different phenotypes that could all kind of naturally occur. Uh, a single gene determines a particular trait. Two or multiple alleles brings variation to the trait. Genes are found in all known organisms. Uh, alleles can be identified in multi-genome organisms. Um, genes occur as individual units. Uh, alleles always occur in pairs. So that's, that's a, a good distinction too. So every allele is going to be connected. A gene is just going to be part of that. Encode for a single protein, produce opposite phenotypes, create the individual, bring differences to the individuals and populations. So a gene, this is a good example, a section of DNA, allele, different versions of the gene, chromosome, a long strand of DNA coiled and wrapped up that contains only genes. So a chromosome is just a bunch of different genes. And a gene is a section that holds instructions for making a protein. And then the allele is just a different version of the gene. What is an allele? For every gene, you have two of the same alleles, or you can have two different alleles. So these are alleles. Alleles go into a gene. A gene goes into a 
phenotype. Phenotypes make up a strain. Strains are just variations of species. And then again, that can also get you into epigenetics. I would suggest watching the Amoeba Sisters video on epigenetics. So all of that uh, taxonomic, biological, and genetic information was really only meant to be a, a rough pass. That's going to kind of help us understand more about the, the mushroom life cycle. And we're going to try to run through that just as quickly. This stuff might be a little more familiar. Everything prior was uh, also a suggestion for people to just get familiar with these topics, this terminology, and uh, push yourself to learn it because it really can be that basic if you just focus on the mushroom you're growing kind of go up from there. You know, you don't need to know all fungi. You don't need to know all bacteria or every genus inside the family or whatever, but figure out what you're working with and figure out where it fits in in that regard. And you will have a much easier time trying to uh, develop new, new specimens, essentially. So, talked about a spore. And a spore is a gamete, just like sperm in an egg, or a grain of pollen in a pistil, I suppose. And not all terms are interchangeable like that, and this is one of the few that is, but a gamete has half the genetic information to, you know, come together with another gamete to make a real living organism. Spores germinate into monokaryotic mycelium. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that term right now. A lot of people are trying to isolate mono, monos because they are more likely to breed with sp other species. Um, probably the most popular one recently that people are doing is um, psilocybe cabinzis with psilocybe natalensis. There's a few different crosses out there. Um, although I know of one that wasn't done with spore isolation or monokaryotes. Uh, most people are isolating spores, growing out monokaryotic mycelium, and using those for interspecific crosses. Uh, haploid. Uh, I see some people describing monokaryotic mycelium or monokaryotes as haploid and they are essentially in interchangeable. Uh, monokaryotic means to have one nucleus, haploid means to have one set of chromosomes and in this sense they are the same as a one set of chromosomes will be in one nucleus. Uh, another quick consideration if you're breeding mushrooms is tetra and bipolarity. So mating incompatibility in mushrooms is controlled by the mating type loci. In tetrapolar species, two unlinked mating type loci exist, A and B, whereas bipolar, and try to keep this simple, we'll look at the bipolar first. Bipolar species, there's only one locus. So there's one mating locus, which is um, essentially loci locations within the DNA uh, where they need to not only, I guess, be opposite because we're learning seemingly that mushrooms are more complex than we can comprehend at the time, but there are specific specificities within uh, these mating systems. So even if they're different, it's not necessarily a given, but if they're the same, it most likely will not work. So how you could imagine a bipolar system is it has to have a homeodomain transcriptor, transcription factor, which is pretty much just saying either yes or no. 
like we're either alike or not and then there could potentially be specific specificities <laughs> beyond that that could further pr problem be problematic but to keep it simple we could say that the mating the homeo domain transcriptor factors are either uh yes or no we are going to mate and it's not to be confused with sex because it's not although it's similar so you have their first mating factor with the bi uh, the bipolar and then you have pheromones and pheromone receptors and this is also going to be at like a molecular level uh, that is dependent on the GMA and the DNA, which is what makes it uh, bipolar. So you have the homane, homeo domain transcriptors and the pheromones. Bipolar, you have the two. Now, tetrapolar have two mating lo type locus, which include two of those. So you have two uh, mating type loci or the two homeo domain transcriptors and two fer pheromone systems, which is going to give you that tetrapolar factor. So they need to have two sets of pheromones uh, react appropriately to each other, as well as um, be offset in their homeo domain transcripting factors. And then along with that, you have specificity specificities that we're only learning more about. Uh, this was a topic that I was talking to my buddy about um, because mathematically you would say, well, then if you have these four factors, it would ultimately break down to maybe a 50-50% likelihood that two spores would mate. Um, and that doesn't always seem to be the case. Um, and it will probably vary with species. However, this is the most universal and reliable information out there and a very important consideration so if you have two monokaryotic cultures of the same species uh, plated together and you wanted to breed them it's not necessarily a given that they will mate even though they are of the same species and that would be why so this was a good image um, a spore germinates uh, into monokaryotic mycelium and they come together to two will eventually come together and connect in a uh, process called anastomosis let me take a step back real quick so a spur spore will germinate and all that's required for germination is water oxygen in a stable temperature no nutrients are involved for germination and that goes generally for seeds and spores after a spore germinates it undergoes mitosis and it will also do this after it uh, matches up with another spore essentially and becomes dikaryotic uh, when they share their nuclei but even a monokaryotic culture goes through mitosis. It's a type of division, uh, cell division, because I think that a lot of us have uh, been able to visualize at least what mycelium cell replication looks like uh, just as it continues to grow. It stacks on in segments. And it does this in a process called mitosis, which specifically rep replicates the nuclei and the chromosomes. In a, in a specific order in a just like it was before essentially and we'll see how that's different than meiosis here at the very end because generally in the mycelium state it's always going to be mitosis it's always going to be recreating that cell uh, with the same genetic makeup over and over again like if you have a clone it's just going to keep growing just like it would have it's not going to change and it will recreate those uh, those cells in nuclei just as it was prior. Eventually, um, two monotaryotic cultures will come together. Is what we're seeing right here with the red and blue, and they will connect via anastomosis, which just means. 
the cross connection between adjacent channels, tubes, fibers. Anytime mycelium connects, it's anastomosis. Um, and it's not to be confused with plasm plasmagemi, plasmagemi. Uh, the fusion of two protoplasts uh, bringing together two compatible haploid nuclei. And that's uh, what we're seeing here when the blue and the red come together. Now, once the blue and the red come together in this example, they can still connect. And when cells connect without exchanging that genetic information when they don't mix it together it's just anastomosis but when they do mix that genetic information together then it's plasigamy and it's not to be confused because it's not always going to do that it's only going to happen when a two monokaryotic uh, mycelium's come together those which have one nucleus or if a monokaryotic and a dikaryotic come together um, which is known as the Buller phenomenon, actually. And the Buller phenomenon is one example of such autonomous behaviors in which a nucleus in a dikaryon can migrate to and fertilize a mating type compatible monokaryon, leading to opportunities for choosing this. Um, and this is not two dikaryotic mycelians cannot donate a nucleus to one another. In the fruiting bodies, the two nuclei fuse directly after which uh, meiotic spores are produced. Uh, a dikaryon can no longer accept other nuclei, but it can still donate nuclei to a monokaryon. It's the Buller phenomenon. Soma tigami, the fusion of two somatic Hyphae acting as gametes for two sexually compatible mycelia. So that is essentially when the uh, plas plasmagamy is occurring in the monokaryotic cultures. And they are essentially. The two monokaryotic myceliums come together and form the mushroom. And through the entire process, the nuclei are still separated. Uh, the genetic information from the two parent spores, all the way up until the mushroom grows and inside the gills, little formations start to form on the gills called the basidiums, basidia. And the nuclei, you can see here in this the beginning of this first image, the nuclei from the parent spores are still separated until this very next step inside the basidia, uh, they undergo corrigamy. And that's the most, one of the, the beginning of the important part of the genetic transformation. Here, uh, meiosis occurs after, and how that's different than mitosis is how we were saying like the cells inside the mycelium were recreating these same two parent nuclei over and over and over and even through the fruit body only in the basidia does corrigamy occur and actually jumble up all that genetic information and after it does it produces those spores on the top of the basidia and the genetic information from the two parent spores that had been processed through the mycelia all the way up into this point are finally recombined into spores again as gametes and the whole process starts all over again. Um, as a, and uh, it's here also that the zygote is formed. Uh, that would be this guy right here that uh, is the cell that contains, or the nuclei that contains all this, ge the jumbled genetic information. And there it is split out. Let's see if we can find a meiosis is a type of cell division sexually reproduced organs that reduce the number of chromosomes and gametes. So where it, it took those different uh, genetics and smashed them into one, then it breaks it down again 
and divides it so the new cells only have half. It's like they took it, they jumbled it up, and they portioned it out for the new generation to take half of it and go meet somebody new. Uh, images like this help differentiate meiosis and mitosis. Mitosis uh, in the beginning replicating everything very specifically making new cells again just like it was before and then my meiosis breaking it down and turning it into like seeds again jumbling up the genetic information and turning it into uh, gametes another good uh, representation of that mitosis making cells again with the same number of uh, chromosomes that they had originally. Uh, whether that's monokaryotic or dikaryotic, it's reproducing them in the same state. And then once the basidia, the corygamy occurs inside the basidia, then it's going to jumble up those uh, different chromosomes, mix them up, and split them in half again for the seeds. Another good image of nuclear fission, the zygote being formed inside the basidia. And I also talked to somebody, they thought that, uh, well, each basidia should produce the same uh, the same results, and I don't believe that to be true, and I think that uh, genetic, all you have to do is do a multi-spore grow, and you see that you get much more variation from a single spore print than just four different uh, candidates. So each basidia will have its own variation. It's like you took a, just a, a randomizer almost with a, the, the two parent nuclei, and then you just took like if you imagine the two nuclei as words that, you know, got mixed together to make new words or something like that. A gamete is a mature haploid, contains one cell, back to cells. Corygamy produces a zygote, a diploid cell that can be in meiosis. Corygamy and meiosis occur in the basidium of mushrooms. It produces four haploid basidiospores. Now, I went over some biological and taxonomic information. Went over the life cycle of the mushroom and uh, what it means to go from spore to spore uh, genetically. So if we were going to talk about breeding techniques and people breeding mushrooms. Okay. Well, most mushrooms have been bred by mixing spores together simply. Um, you can do that by taking some spores from one print as well as another and putting those onto the same plate for an inoculation and through the genetic exchanges of what we just described, uh, it will occur. It's kind of, uh, you know, probability has a lot to do with it. One thing that I've considered is say if you use 75% of one spore and then 25% of another spore, you would say that the spores that you inoculated with more of you'd have a higher likelihood of those traits showing. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to tell how many spores you're working with when you're, you know, not using a microscope also. Other ways you can do it, I've mixed spores with water uh, and then suck them up to a syringe and then I just put a single drop onto agar, knowing that the spores were mixed in the water. Some people will uh, swab two plates. I've even seen people swab two mushrooms with the same swab so they'll take a sterile swab the swab one mushroom and they'll swap another mushroom with the same swab and take that swab and put it on a plate so really by any means you can uh, mix spores you are 
going to uh, be mixing genetics. In most cases, that they are the same species for sure. A lot of people have been saying lately that this is a sloppier way of breeding uh, when you could be doing spore isolation. Uh, I would say that, you know, most plants uh, were not bred with any sort of verification means, and even most hybrids uh, that people are working with today were also done with conventional methods. Um, one really popular uh, cross, and this was actually done with some uh, with a monokaryotic culture, which was then introduced to a single spore, which caused a cascading uh, donation effect from dikaryotic to monokaryotic mycelium, the albino penis envy, which was documented on the shroomery, um, one of the most popular crosses uh, was done with a fairly uh, uh, advanced technique. However, a good majority are not selective breeding. Uh, choosing parents with particular characteristics to breed together and produce offspring with more desirable characteristics. And this is usually done within the same species and even like the same variation. So you could take the same mushroom over and over and just try to, uh, going from spore, you would select for vigor or yield traits like that. Uh, a good example of what can be done with the selective breeding is brass cutleraceae. This um, single species of brassica has gone on to produce cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, savoy cabbage, calamari, and guyane. Um, which is a great example of the capabilities of even just a single species to produce a wide variety of uh, visually different organisms, a huge variety of phenotypes and genotypes. Um, I guess to go along with that, interspecific breeds are becoming a hot topic. Uh, that's more so why you would want to do spore isolation. Um, my impression has generally been if you are isolating spores, you are uh, trying to do interspecific. If you were trying to keep traits, um, generally going crossing two spores, you don't you don't know what the characteristics are going to be. Like when every spore is produced, it contains like a genetic lottery of who knows what is going to grow out of this. Um, so generally, if you're isolating spores, that is just to force a breeding that wouldn't naturally occur. Um, problems you might have with pairing would go back to uh, tetrapolarity, even to um, mushrooms of the same species may have issues, but you're also going to, uh, you know, they're going to be further off taxonomically, so they're going to have less similarities that are going to allow that to happen. Uh, if you really wanted to force a breed, there are more advanced breeding techniques like uh, deadly dikaryotization, where you would take a eukaryotic culture, like a clone, um, and you can imagine the dikaryotic state oh, it has the two cells or the two nuclei within one cell. And what you're doing is you're mechanically separating those with a blender. So you're cutting the cell in half, separating the nuclei, and then it's done in a solution where essentially the low magnesium levels, if I remember correctly, prevent it from forming clamp connections. So the individually um, separated nuclei have no choice but to reform in a monokaryotic state, which can then be used to cross with another monokary on that was probably done in the same process. So like if you had a, a specimen, a strain that was just like it had the best traits that you could have ever imagined, um, or maybe the one of the best traits you could ever imagine, then you have another clone that has the other best trait you really want, you could daddy dikaryotize these and potentially match them together and hope that those traits come back together it does get kind of complex i know that even if you are uh, pairing these it's not a, a, again it's um 
it'll go back to tetrapolarity and they are not guaranteed to pair. Um, I know some people who did just that and they thought, okay, well, I have these two great specimens. We'll decaratize them and we'll pair them together and it will be simple as that. Well, they did and they tried to pair them and they didn't pair because of tetrapolarity most likely because they were the same species. And, you know, you can't, there is no given in that sense. And the next thing you can do if you really want to do that, well, you could say, oh, go back to spore them. But once you go back to spore, you're really limiting your, uh, your stability and those things that you wanted to save. So I know some people are having success uh, with dedicarization. It is absolutely a way to achieve monokaryotic cultures. Um, it is not necessarily a given, though. And it poses its own problems in that regard. Uh, there is some more information out there. I can provide links for anybody who's interested in a deeper understanding of dedicarization. And I suppose, really, if you were DDK, you would want a plethora of specimens. Usually, that's your best bet. Even with spore isolation, it's almost the same thing. Um, these cells are going to have their requirements, and they are not always going to um, pair with each other how you'd like. I know some people were saying that they were obtaining... Uh, monokaryotes without isolating spores, and that's absolutely possible. However, you are going to need a microscope to verify that. You cannot verify uh, monokaryotic cultures without a microscope like some people I know uh, think that they have. However, you can do it by swapping. Uh, Electroporation is a technique used for bacteria. I suppose I thought I had seen it uh, used for higher fungi, but I could be wrong. It is similar to like chemical poration in that uh, cells and plasmid are mixed together. So you have like, you know, you have your, you could have uh, two two different types of bacteria or two different you know, DNAs and then the electrical pulse um, pretty much permeates the cell and uh, forces the DNA into the cell. Chemoporation and electroporation I only mention because things like calcium chloride treatments uh, for eukaryotes are being recommended for for mushroom growers, and I, you know, there isn't information supporting that. And if anybody is selling a calcium chloride uh, transformation kit for eukarya, there is no information that suggests that's possible. Um, to go along with that, I guess, chemoporation, electroporation, calcium chloride transformation, and polyethylene glycol transformation of fungi without a cell wall icer is not possible and that kind of gets me in the protoplast fusion because beyond dedicarization protoplast fusion is probably your only other option for um approaches S mixing spores spore isolation dedicarization protoplast fusion are the only approaches that i'm aware of that are viable breeding techniques for mushrooms um, beyond bacteria and yeast you will need to use um, protoplast fusion uh, chemoporation electroporation and calcium chloride uh, modifications they just they they aren't going to work a lot of people are getting interested in protoplast fusion uh, it's almost like a way that you can uh, maybe bypass pheromones. Um, in my opinion, you might be able to force uh, the DNA 
because of the the fusants. Um, but a lot of things get problematic there, like uh, sterility and whether or not your project will fruit appropriately. Protoplast fusion essentially removes the cell wall and then using things like polyethylene glycol, electrofusion, um, or even calcium chloride. Uh, if you remove the cell wall, then you can essentially force the DNA to combine. Uh, not going to get into this too much. I could do a whole video on protoplast fusion. I could do a whole video on data characterization. Um, I already have a full video on spore isolation. Um, I may do a video on just a spore smash. I would say if you are just trying to breed two mushrooms of the same species, mix some spores together and isolate for, take, take more spores off of the ones that produce traits that you're after. If you're doing that, something that's most commonly recommended is use two visually distinct mushrooms, like a white one and a blue one, and once you see that they've crossed on the initial fruiting, and it's clear that they have, because it's, it's not always clear that they cross, but if you have two very visually different mushrooms, and the next generation you can get spores off that one, and you know that they cross, then it's just kind of like a matter of continually doing that and selecting for traits. But there is a chance that you might, uh, say, select something that didn't cross. And so if they aren't visually distinct from each other, it could be hard to tell if the cross occurred. And that's why a lot of people do say that they like doing spore isolation. But for me, I feel like you get a lot more diversity also just by mixing a bunch together because usually whatever's fastest or whatever is going to pop first. Like you're going to have a lot more vigor in there um, and just like a lot more probability. So really anything could happen. Uh, but you can have more of a guarantee if you are isolating monokaryotes and stuff like that. Um, if you were trying to save traits, like I was saying, you could try the DDK. Um, and I would only really recommend protoplast fusion for interspecific or intergeneric crosses. It's something I was looking into for a while because I want to do an intergeneric and interspecific cross. But the more that I understand about, like, sterility and vigor um it just doesn't seem like that's what the mushroom wants and that could almost be a whole video on its own because i was really learning all this so i could you know do a do an intergeneric cross but my idea is if i did have a successful intergeneric or interspecific cross that it would one be sterile or two it wouldn't be, but would eventually be. And that would be a shame to put so much work into something um, just to have it totally crap out. And that's about as basic as I could put it, although I could go into that all day. Um, and I think that it kind of suggests that we don't want to push the system too hard. We don't want to push uh, what these things are capable of, um, although we could. And I think that there's a lot of potential... I know this could sound crazy, but even in things like uh, CRISPR, you know, like GMOs, because if you uh, if you do protoplast fusion, um, nine times, unless you're using an organic cell wall lyser, like an enzyme that came from uh, trichoderma is one, and then maybe organic calcium chloride, those, that's the only method of protoplast fusion that would be organic and might not classify something as a GMO. Um, most protoplast protocols use um, synthetic cell wall lysers or even a hydrochloric acid, I think, could be used, uh, as well as inorganic calcium chloride or polyethylene glycol, which is an organic. And... At least the UK describes uh, GMO as something that couldn't have occurred in nature. But in theory, 
with an organic cell wall isomer and an organic fusant than it could have. Would using organic ingredients make something potentially more stable? Uh, yeah, who knows? Sounds like a, a lot of meddling for um, maybe no purpose. Personally, I think that there's a lot more value in selected breeding. Um, I still might do a protoplast fusion thing someday, but I don't know. I'd love to hear some community feedback on that. What do you think about uh, pushing intergeneric or interspecific species? Um, interspecific breeding does occur in nature. I basically feel like nature knows to some extent. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a little idea of... Uh, how different um, mating potentials can happen. So say you throw down a mixture of spores and uh, we'll have red represent one variety and then we'll have blue represent another variety. So you could think that, uh, I guess, all the spores in a perfect world, I mean, if everything was completely even, probably grow, you know, in theory, something like this. And what you would get is your purple. But that's not always the case. Another possibility so you get a little more of an interesting phenomenon. So, have our blue come over, meet up with that red, and then yes, we would have our purple. And what it could do is meet up with the blue, and then we're going to have like almost a purple blue. this red and I guess that would you know the equal contributions would leave it more in a purple state and that could kind of continue to happen uh, back and forth all the way around give you a uh, because of that that bullet phenomenon there's no you can't assume that these are going to grow in any which way or that they are going to um, pair in any sort in certain uh, certain types of means so another good visualization I think is so Workman said with the albino penis envy uh, isolation I can't remember which one he said he used first but I don't think it really matters for the example but he say he had his uh, albino penis, penis envy from a spore isolate and then he said he let that grow out so what he had was this monokaryotic culture and then what he said he did from there was introduce a single spore from the other culture what that did was it took that original inoculation right here and then just cascaded it in a similar manner
And unless you're doing spore isolation, you're not really going to know at which ratio um, you've mixed your spores. And it can get a little confusing. Um, so let's say you just you know, if you're if you're just taking some spores off of a print, you don't know how much you use, and you could very easily use more of one than another. So let's say you had about let's do sixty percent. You got six dots there. We'll go ahead and throw. Oops. Throw. 40% on the blues, and if we had the most um, stable, prediction, predictable pairing, I suppose, it would look something like this. Now, whereas it's clearly mostly purple, if we looked at the purples as um, half and halves, blues and reds, there would be a genetic dominance of the red genetics. So that is probably just another consideration that you want to make. Um, again, a spore contains a lottery of genetic information. So even though two, two spores come together to give you the purple, you still don't know exactly what's in the purple because of its DNA. It's going to have some of its genomes from the red, might have some of its genomes from the blue, and it might even have a mixed reflection of the, the genetics, but you're not going to know until you fruit it. You will not know until you fruit it. Now, if you did want to know before you fruited it what you were working with, you wouldn't work with spores. You would work with um, a clone. And uh, we know that the clone mycelium is dikaryotic, or, so it contains two nuclei. Um, you would need to de-dikaryote de de it. So if you imagine a, a cell, this is just a piece of mycelium. So it goes on one way, it continues to go on another, and you have your red and blue nuclei. These are representing nuclei here. This is mycelium. And if you're de-dikaryoting, de de you're going to use a blender to mechanically separate this. And that'll expose the nuclei from the mycelium. So if you had a fruit that was formed off of the two parent spores, you can re-expose those nuclei by blending it simply. But I'm going to take a step back real quick. People say, well, how would you mix spores? Um, there's a lot of ways you can do that. 90% um, of strains that are out were just mixed by mixing spores. So you take a spore print, uh, you'd have your petri dish, and you throw some spores in one, and then you throw some spores in of another. And they would just grow out in odd, you know, mostly consistent um, morphologies. However, you don't know that uh, you aren't going to get like a, a red guy in there or a blue guy popping out here. So wherever you take 
a transfer off the dish is going to be reflective of different genotypes. One thing I've done um, when transferring off of germ plates is I'll use the most of it as possible. So I'll take like a transfer from here, 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 and just pretty much try to obtain all of that. Another thing I've done is just kind of get a scalpel and try to get in here and just drag the mic from all around the paint and then I'll take that that I'll pick up that contains all of that and then I'll transfer it in a single location to another petri dish uh, or I'll even just take that and I'll transfer it into a liquid culture uh, another thing that you can do is um, or another thing I've done even is make a spore syringe with two different types of spores so you just take some water mix your spores in it and then when you go to put it on your petri dish you can kind of assume that there's just take one drop and then there's going to be a little mixture of the reds and blues another thing I've seen people do is double swabby mushrooms so where people are doing swabs they have taken a just swab two different um, spores and play with that. Taking a step back and <laughs> work forward again to the, the DDK after we've exposed our nuclei. So now these no longer represent spores. These represent the nuclei as they were in a mycelium cell. But we came in here and cut that open with the blender. It relieved the nuclei, or otherwise known as protoplast in some cases. And now we're left with the nuclei. And we did this in a glucose solution with peptone P. So this is a solution that we blended the mic in, the mycelium, and it contains uh, peptone P, otherwise known as oxoid. And shout out to Julian Matucci, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, for popularizing this concept. Hopefully I'm explaining it well enough. Um, after you've blended your uh, mycelium culture, your dikaryotic mycelium culture, in the peptone P solution, which also contains um, a percentage of glucose, I believe, uh, what's going on here is there is a low magnesium level um, in this protein right here and I believe that the glucose is acting as a food but the peptone P is the most important part so whereas these guys are naturally gonna wanna they're gonna start growing mycelium uh, naturally and they're gonna wanna start coming back together but what happens is because of the low magnesium levels here in the peptone it just keeps them from forming clamp connections. Um, but what's going to happen is they're going to want to form a clamp connection. And a clamp connection is essentially what mycelium uses to transfer the nuclei between uh, cells as they continue to grow. So naturally we have the red and blue nuclei from our dikaryotic culture that was formed when two spores formed. And they use these little um, structures on the mycelium to essentially force over the nuclei in a consistent um, and even, even pattern. That's how they replicate the genetic information over and over again this peptone P in the low magnesium levels is going to prevent this. So when these cultures grow, they're just going to keep growing without having the ability to 
exchange their nuclei and share it. So when these cultures grow out, they could be reutilized for other breeding projects. And again, just a rough overview. There's more info out there. I'd love to do a video on just uh, D.D. Kane, maybe even uh, try to do it with a uh, good old Julian or something like that. So we started talking about protoplast, and protoplast um, is pretty much the nuclei. Uh, protoplast fusion and dedicarization share a lot of similarities. So protoplast fusion, as far as I understand it, why you would use protoplast fusion um, compared to a standard breeding practice is because uh, to bypass things like pheromones and homeodomain transcriptors. So if you wanted to, uh, and this is uh, also similar to spore isolation, which uh, I apparently skipped and I will touch on that right now. Um, but protoplast fusion um, doesn't necessarily have to be done with uh, mycelium. You can obtain protoplast from spores, I do believe, but it's most done with uh, clones because often uh, your isolated specimens are going to be more valuable than the genetic lottery that is spores. Protoplast fusion is also a lot more forceful than spore isolation, and I'll show you how uh, right now. And I guess also it would be preferable over dedicarization mating because it is more forceful with its fusants. So, similar to DDK, the dedicarization, we are going to remove these nuclei from the cell. But we aren't going to do it with the blender by slicing through it. No, we're going to do it with a cell wall lyser. So, lysers are usually enzymes or chemicals. Hydrochloric acid could be one. Um, has a pH of 1. Um, it is the strongest acid known. Or um, enzymes extracted from trichoderma. as well as other synthetics. And what these cell lysers are going to do, you're going to make a solution of them, and then you're going to be putting the, the mycelium into the solution, and the enzymes, or even uh, acids in some cases, are going to get all up in here. And... Uh, also, it'll eat away, it's being lysed away, degraded away, and then before you know it, we're left with just our, uh, our nuclei. The nuclei are really sensitive to uh, the water pressure, so you're going to use an osmotic stabilizer. Um, sorbitol, sucrose, um, I might have those kind of wrong, I don't have my notes on me, but you'll use an osmotic stabilizer and those vary for uh, different reasons. And then the fusant comes into play, which is uh, where it gets a little different than dedicarization, whereas uh, dedicarization, you're trying to isolate these away and create monocultures that you'll use um, for future projects. Pro protoplast fusion um, isn't necessarily focused on both of these nuclei. Uh, generally it's done for interspecific or intergeneric hybrids. So you might do this with two specimens. Um, let's say we did it with two specimens. We uh, took cell lysers to both of our dikaryotic cultures. And let's say that these repre represent two different um, species. So this could be one species of mushrooms, this could be another. And we will only use um, one or the other of these pairings, and we'll probably try to pair them both. So we could say that um, this will be a pairing, and this will be a pairing. 
So once we've uh, isolated our, our protoplast, um, and these are going to be uh, rough, rough pairings basically. Like we aren't going to be, we could isolate the nuclei further potentially um, with a product or a process like dedicaritization. But for general protoplast fusion, where if you were just trying to cross two species and not care about their genetic traits as much because you were just trying to, I guess, say, break a clade wall even, then um, you wouldn't separate these. This would be done inside the same petri dish or inside the same uh, media bottle, essentially. But you are going to have a couple different pairing capabilities, even working with just uh, two different cultures. If you uh, protoplast fuse two cultures through most protocols, uh, s lysing the cell walls like this, you will have four different nuclei uh, with different uh, potentials. Um, and you also have kind of like this third, this third potential right here where um, it, is a, it is a possibility. And I guess you also have the original potentials right here. So, minus all that, we still have our nuclei. And this is where the fusing comes into play. You can use things like polyethylene glycol and calcium chloride. What these things do is essentially they take the DNA inside the nuclei and force them to to reinsert themselves um, within the cell wall. So when the cultures do come back and form together, whereas they regularly may, may not have and uh, potentially this could still form off in a relatively normal state but still contain the genetic information because of the fusing. could also um, take on embodiment um, via clamp connections potentially. Uh, protoplast fusion, intergeneric, interspecific reads are very complex with um, relatively little potential. The studies that are coming out with capabilities um, seem to be for uh, the biomedical industry generally. Protoplast fusion kind of gets me into electroporation and chemoporation, um, both of which are done with cell lysers, so you need the, the nuclei exposed for it to work. Um, have your culture. You would um, use a cell lyser lys to remove the cell wall. You'd be left with the nu nucleides. Electroporation and chemoporation have very similar concept in that they induce pores into 
the set or the the nucleus that then essentially aligns them and charges them to uh, kind of force the genetic information through them and be rearranged. So chemicals that are used to do this are, um, I mean, the fusants are kind of a good example of a similar phenomenon. I can't think of any chemicals that are specifically used in chemoporation. I think chemoporation, if you were doing chemoporation with bacteria, uh, calcium chloride would be one. Otherwise, electroporation, um, electricity is essentially doing this process right here. Uh, just by certain types of pulses and charges and frequencies, uh, they can manipulate the DNA through the, the nucleuses, the nuclei, um, like that. Again, uh, chemicals that could also induce this effect. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. That kind of leads me in to my final point. I know that there's a lot of confusions for uh, people are saying that you can use calcium chloride or uh, PEG as fusants. Uh, well, we know from protoplast fusion that yes, this is true. But like with protoplast fusion, we saw that the cell wall needed to be removed. And where this comes from is a confusion. I call it the fusion, the fusant confusant, uh, the fusion confusion. Uh, so this is a mycelium cell. And remember, you can get your nuclei from two different specimens. I just like to use the, the one specimen as an example because once you have your nuclei, they are individuals. No matter where you get them, if you have a single nuclei, it's a single nuclei. Um, even if they're from the same culture, they're going to act um, in similar regards. And we're going to let this represent a bacterial cell. Um, so you can use calcium chloride and even polyethylene glycol for transformation of bacterial cells. And we know that you can use calcium chloride and polyethylene glycol for the fusion, for protoplast fusion. So why can't you do it the same? If we come in here and try to put some, some calc to or PEG around here, that's going to work. Now if we do that here, it's not going to work. And the difference is, it's because the DNA that we're trying to affect is in here. Let that black represent the DNA. I'm a horrible drawer. I'm sorry. So why can the why can the calcium chloride not affect the the eukaryotes, but it can affect the prokaryotes? Well, that is simply because of what color can we do it with? <laughs> uh, it's just because of the nuclear wall. The calcium chloride has no problem penetrating the prokaryote's cell wall, just like it has no problem penetrating the eukaryote's cell wall. The main problem here is there's a nuclear wall protecting the genetic information with inside the eukarya. So the fusant can get up in here, and then it says, hey DNA, why don't you, you know, go over to the other guy and likewise you so it's like cool we can do that we'll, we'll fuse together but then the calcium chloride gets into the the cell wall and then it's like well 
where's the DNA at? I don't know where the DNA is because it's hidden behind the nuclear wall. The cell wall compositions between bacteria and fungi or uh, eukarya are pretty similar. The nuclear wall makeup, the chemical makeup, the uh, molecular makeup of the nuclear wall is much different. And that's basically why it doesn't work. Real quick, touching on spore isolation because I skipped it. Why is everyone doing spore isolation? Well, mainly because everybody wants monokaryote. Um, why would you want a monokaryote? Um, well, the, the reasons for it really differ. We see that Workman used his for a certain reason. Um, basically, if you, you know, if you put a bunch of spores down, they have a tendency to go for each other. Um, at least of the same species, right? And now, if you were doing something like the Natalensis um, or the uh, the Natalensis Cabenzi hybrid, um, or even something like Workman's, where you wanted a for sure cross, you n just needed to know that they cross. It really just lies in the monokaryotic culture. Um, you do a spore isolation, you can take this monokaryotic culture and, you know, just fraction it off onto its own plate. And then you can just use these for different pairings or different experiments of any kind. Uh, and usually that's going to be interspecific hybrids. Uh, on, or maybe a really unique instance like Workman's, but what you're trying to do is, like, I think the best example is if you have a bunch of grizzly bears, let the red be the grizzly bears, and then you have a bunch of brown bears, you know, they're just going to hang out together. They're going to do what they want to do. But if you just have one grizzly bear and one brown bear, well, they're kind of running out of options. No matter how much they don't want to, they're running out of options. And stress is also a very interesting mating factor. Uh, we won't get too much into that. It has a wide range of implications. Okay, so I just had to pop back in here real quick. A couple things I forgot. One thing I wanted to uh, point out was this interspecific project done by Hokuto Kinoto. Um, I want to say he is in Japan, although I don't know if that's correct. It could be uh, something else. But basically, he crossed a... A earring guy with a uh, nebrodensis, I believe, and use that as the starting point to basically work back phylogenically so he could have other candidates to breed with other species in different clades. Um, so if you're interested in interspecifics uh, hybrids and um, trying to go back in clades, to have different potentials. I really suggest reading this. It gets kind of uh, complex and confusing. Uh, the summary kind of right here says that he crossed a regular Pleurotus with a foreign variety of earring guy, uh, variation Tulensis, um, maybe otherwise known as Nebrodensis. Um, uh, or Iringai Feralu. So I think that uh, Feralu and Nebrodensis, Nebrodinus, um, were considered similar enough that he was able to utilize that. And then he took that hybrid and was able to cross it with another Iringai species, which brought him further back in the clade. 
and he was able to eventually cross it with um, other varieties of Pleurotus and Nebrodensis. So if I could, um, it's kind of hard to find a decent phylogenic tree of Pleurotus because they're so um, diversely researched around the world. Uh, here, this one kind of shows you we have Earring guy variation fairly. Um, I think that previously uh, fairly was um, maybe viewed as uh, a more traditional style of earring guy, but later differentiated. So I think that he took fairly and crossed it with another form of earring guy, which then he took and cross with the Nebrodensis and was able to work into more common Pleurotus varieties. Um, but I'm not completely sure. The, the study doesn't necessarily point out which strains um, as specifically. And it's kind of understandable this was a patent. So it's not like he's necessarily going through and giving away all his secrets, but he has clearly demonstrated that these techniques are possible. Uh, another phylogenic tree of Pleurotus seen earring guy up here at the top and Nebrodensis closely related to that. Um, other varieties of Pleurotus that I'm not as familiar with, uh, Populinus, uh, Fossilatus, um, we can see down here Jamor or the pink oyster, as well as Citrina pileatus, uh, the gold oysters. This is also kind of a good example of clade seeing the uh, pink down uh, here. It eventually broke off from something that also created a, a yellow oyster. And if you wanted to say cross a yellow with a pink, you would find a, a way to go back along these clade walls until you found that related ancestor. And then you might be able to take that related ancestor and use it down the other direction of the clade. Uh, I thought it would also be appropriate to point out the phylogenic Phylogenic analysis that Alan Rockefeller recently uploaded onto the shroomery. I think this is kind of a big inspiration for the Natalinsis hybrids that we see. Uh, I think that Kyler was actually talking to Alan, maybe with a couple other people, maybe Yoshi and Julian even, kind of working, working this out a little bit together. Uh, we can see here that Cubenzi's might have came from a natalensis at some point. So with natalensis being its closely, most closely related relative, uh, it makes sense as to why we're seeing these crosses proliferate. Uh, you could potentially also take the natalensis and cross it with the chuzongensis uh, from China. And I think that maybe even Kyler was working on that. Uh, then you could take that and potentially cross it with the avoid assistiata. And that is definitely, when was this even uploaded? This wasn't too long ago. Just a year ago, Alan uh, kind of came across that and definitely intrigued a lot of people within the community. Just going to skim through those for you guys. Great information in those regards. Another quick thing I didn't get a touch on was the genetic variation versus environmental variation. So just real quick running through this, uh, genetic variation is the variation of genomes between the individuals in the same species. Uh, environmental variation is the alteration of the phenotype of a particular genotype as a response to the environment. Uh, genetic some examples include coat colors of animal skin color, hair color, color of eyes, freckles, and dimples. Phenotypic differences in identical twins are examples. Um, so just how like two twins can be exactly genetically identical, they could still look different because 
of the environments that genetically can cause can be caused by mutation of genes, gene flow, random gene random mating, random fertilization, and crossing over between homologous chromosomes. Uh, can be caused by the external environment factors such as light, temperature, moisture, climate, exposure, minerals, diet, cultural, and lifestyle. Uh, genetics can be passed through generations and through natural selection and affect evolution. Uh, environmentals do not cause changes in the genome and have no effect on evolution. Important considerations for breeders right there. Um, quickly touching on mutations in biology any alterations in the nucleic acid sequence, um, pretty much the DNA of an organism virus. Uh, mutations result from errors during DNA or viral replications, mitosis, my meiosis, or other types of damage to DNA, such as pyramid dimers caused by exposure to ultraviolet ra radiation. Um, so mutations are at the genome level, just an important thing to be mindful of um, when looking at environmental mutations as well, I suppose. Uh, ultraviolet light as a mutagen, light induces specific mutations in the cellular and skin genome, such as UV signature and triplet mutations. Um, Important considerations when looking at things like the albino penis envy, which was made with the PF albino, which was made with UV mutation. That's a big reason why it's believed that the albino penis envy is so unstable uh, because UV mutations can commonly be repaired. And how I understand that to happen is mainly when they're exposed to light. The light aids in the reparation of the UV mutations. The genetic lesions produced by UV radiation are often repaired soon after they are formed through a process called nucleotide excision repair. Okay. If there's any questions, I'd love to really start a conversation about some of this, or if there's anything that I was like horribly wrong on, I'd love to try to update it. But, and again, I was really hoping this would just be an introduction to some of the more important factors that go into mushroom breeding. I know it's a huge topic. I know there's a lot of people want to learn about it. I know there's a lot of Patreons from people with not a lot of uh, experience or credentials. So we got to try our best to open source this and share with each other and uh, distill it even further, make this even simpler for people to understand. I mean, I feel like I went over a lot of stuff for how long this video is and I feel like we could make it more simple, more better, do it.